Hello everybody. Welcome to Daily News Simplified. An answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today we shall be analyzing the Hindu newspaper dated 23rd of February of the New Delhi edition. The topics to be discussed today has been presented on your screen. Time stamping for the same has been provided in the description box below. Let us begin our today's discussion. Now this particular article appears on page number 9 and is titled as Government eyes the public private fund to give research and development a shot in the arm. Now this article highlights that the government of India has proposed to create a new fund in order to boost the research and development ecosystem within India. Now before we understand the government's proposal let us have a brief understanding about the R&D ecosystem within India. The innovations in the field of science and technology are considered to be major drivers to promote economic growth and development and to ensure the social well-being of a people within the country. If you look at the most of the developed countries across the world, these countries have basically become developed because of their investment in the field of research and development. By promoting higher amount of investment in research and development, these countries have not only been able to promote higher economic growth but they have also been able to improve the quality of life of their citizens. Even in case of India, India has made immense contribution in the field of science and technology. In the ancient times, immense contribution was made by people such as Aryabhatta, Brahmagupta etc. And in recent times after India's independence, India has made rapid advancements in the field of nuclear research, space technology, biotechnology etc. Similarly, the gross expenditure in research and development in terms of absolute value has got tripled from 24,000 crore in the year 2004-05 to rupees 1.04 lakh crore in the year 2014-15. Now, in spite of the fact that there has been an increase in the overall gross expenditure in research and development in terms of absolute value, there are a number of problems with the R&D ecosystem within India. First and foremost, we can look at the stagnation in the gross expenditure on the research and development as percentage of India's GDP. Now, this has remained stagnant in the last one decade at 0.7% of India's GDP. So, since 2004-05 to 2014-15, India has been spending only around 0.7% of its GDP on research and development. And this is considered to be quite lower as compared to other countries. In case of China, it is 2.1% in USA, it is 2.8% and in case of Israel, it is much higher at 4.3%. The second problem with respect to R&D ecosystem within India is that most of the expenditure on research and development is mainly incurred by the public sector and the amount of expenditure incurred by private sector is quite lower. Now, out of total 0.7% of expenditure on research and development, 0.4% is contributed by public sector and only 0.3% is contributed by the private sector. Now, this is considered to be quite problematic because in case of other countries, particularly the developed economies, usually it is a private sector investment in the field of research and development, which is much higher as compared to public sector investment. The next issue is related to the problems with the government expenditure. Now, most of the public sector expenditure in the field of research and development is basically incurred by the central government. And the share of investment incurred by the state government is quite lower. Secondly, investment in research and development on health is considered to be an important tool in order to promote the social well-being. However, in case of India, the amount of investment in research and development on health is considered to be quite lower as compared to other countries. Now, these three problems can be considered to be the problems with respect to the inputs of the R&D ecosystem. With respect to the problems in the outputs of the R&D ecosystem, we can basically look at the amount of patents that we are producing within India on an annual basis. And it is normally seen that the amount of patents that we produce on an annual basis is much lower as compared to other countries. Now, this can be captured with respect to India's poor ranking on number of international reports that are published in order to measure the innovation across the world. For instance, we have the International IP Index 
which is published by the Global Innovation Policy Center of the US Chamber of Commerce. Then we have the Global Innovation Index that is published by the World Intellectual Property Organization. Then we have the Global Competitiveness Report that is published by the World Economic Forum. And as you can see here, India's ranking on each of these three indices which measure the innovation is quite poorer. Now, as stated before, presently the private sector investment in the field of research and development is quite lower. Hence, in order to incentivize greater amount of private sector investment, the government of India has proposed to set up a new fund worth Rs 40 crores. Under the government's proposal, whenever the private sector entities come together and pool in their money in order to undertake research and development in new and emerging technologies, such as the artificial intelligence, quantum computing, etc. Then the government of India shall provide the matching contribution from this 40 crore fund. Now, apart from such a measure, what should the government of India do in order to boost the R&D ecosystem within India? First and foremost, India, from being a net consumer of knowledge, has to become a net producer of knowledge, for which the government of India has to undertake a number of measures. First and foremost, presently the gross enrollment ratio at the primary education level has increased to around 100%. However, the problem with respect to primary education lies in the fact that the learning outcomes of the students has continued to remain poor. So going forward, we need to improve the outcomes at the primary education level in order to improve the cognitive skills of the students. Secondly, if you look at the universities in the developed economies, Apart from focusing on the general teaching, these foreign universities also focus on fostering innovation and research and development. However, in case of India, the Indian universities so far have emphasized only on teaching and there has been less amount of emphasis on fostering innovation. So going forward, we need to foster innovation within the Indian universities in order to boost the research and development ecosystem. Thirdly, we need to incentivize greater amount of private sector investment in the field of research and development and this can possibly be done by the corporate social responsibility which can be imposed on the private sector entities. And lastly, in order to reap the benefits associated with the emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence, quantum computing, big data, etc., the government of India should launch new missions on such advanced technologies. For instance, in the recent union budget, the finance minister has announced the national mission on quantum computing. So we need to launch similar missions on such new advanced technologies in order to boost the R&D ecosystem. Now, based upon video analysis, a main question for your practice here could be India has to transition from being a net consumer to net producer of knowledge. In this regard, discuss various problems with the research and development ecosystem within India. Also suggest some measures as to how India can become the global leader in the field of science and technology. Next, we have an article on page number 15 that reads as four banks under the prompt corrective action being monitored. Now, this particular article highlights that the Reserve Bank of India is presently monitoring the financial health of the four banks that are presently under the prompt corrective action. These four banks as highlighted in the article include the Indian Overseas Bank, Central Bank of India, Yuko Bank and the United Bank of India. Hence, with respect to your upcoming prelims, you should understand as to what exactly is the prompt corrective action. The RBI has introduced the concept of the prompt corrective action framework in order to monitor the financial health of the banks. So as the financial health of the banks deteriorates, such banks are placed under certain kind of restrictions by the RBI. The idea behind the imposition of such restrictions is to improve the overall financial position of the banks. So under the PCA framework, in order to monitor the financial health of the banks, the RBI mainly looks at the four indicators. These four indicators are the capital adequacy ratio as mentioned under the Basel 3 norms, the net non-performing assets of the banks, the return on assets that basically pertains to the percentage of profits earned by the banks and the leverage ratio. On each of these four indicators, the RBI has fixed a threshold level. So as soon as the threshold level on these four indicators is breached, such a bank would be placed under the prompt corrective action framework. For instance, with respect to net non-performing asset, 
the threshold level is greater than or equal to 6 percentage. So, if the net non-performing assets of the banks increases to a level greater than or equal to 6 percentage, then such a bank would be placed under the prompt corrective action. Similarly, with respect to return on assets, if the overall profits earned by a bank for a period of 2 to 3 years remains negative, then this would mean that the bank is incurring high amount of losses and automatically such a bank would be placed under the PCA framework of the RBI. Now, the threshold levels on each of these four indicators are not important with respect to your prelims examination. Rather, what is important to note here is that the PCA framework tracks the financial health of the banks in terms of four indicators. And as stated, these four indicators are the capital adequacy ratio, net non-performing assets, return on assets and the leverage ratio. So, as soon as a bank is placed under the prompt corrective action, then the RBI imposes a set of restrictions on these banks in order to improve their financial health. Some of these restrictions include halting the branch expansion of such banks, preventing the banks from paying the dividend to shareholders, limit on loans to a particular sector. Now, this is basically done in order to ensure that a bank does not get overexposed to a particular sector. And in some of the extreme cases, the RBI can even supersede the bank's board and take over its management. Now, the PCA framework of the RBI becomes quite important because the banks in case of India have accumulated more amount of non-performing assets. So, the PCA framework of the RBI can be considered as one of an important tool in order to reduce the non-performing assets of the Indian banks. With respect to capital adequacy ratio, it has been laid down under the Basel 3 guidelines. Now, the overall rationale behind the introduction of the capital adequacy ratio is that the banks should have sufficient amount of their own capital in order to cover the risk from the non-performing assets. Now, this is quite different from the statutory liquidity ratio or the cash reserve ratio. Under statutory liquidity ratio or the cash reserve ratio, the banks are required to maintain certain percentage of the depositors money in order to cover the risk from the bad loans. However, both under SLR and CRR, it is a depositors money that has been kept aside by the banks. However, in case of capital adequacy ratio, it is the bank's own capital that is required to be kept aside in order to cover the risk from the bad loans. Now, the capital adequacy ratio is calculated as the tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital divided by the risk weighted assets wherein the tier 1 capital is basically the equity or the money that has been infused by the promoters of the bank and the tier 2 capital is the debt that is the money that has been borrowed by the bank in order to meet the capital adequacy ratio norms. And as you can see here in the denominator we have the risk weighted asset. Now, the risk weighted asset here basically means that whenever the bank gives loans to any of its customer, a particular bank is required to assign a risk weightage to such a loan. And such kind of risk weightage is assigned depending upon the credit worthiness of a borrower. Now, the Basel 3 has come out with detailed guidelines as to how the bank has to assign the risk weightage to its loans. Now, for example, let's say the bank gives a loan worth rupees 100 to its customer and for such a customer, the banks assign a risk weightage of 10 percentage. Now, what this essentially means that when a bank is giving loan worth rupees 100, the bank can recover maximum 90 rupees from such a customer and there is a probability that the bank may not be able to recover 10 rupees since there could be a possible default by such a customer. Similarly, let's say a bank gives loans worth rupees 200 to an another customer and in this particular case, the bank may give a risk weightage of 15 percentage. So, once again, this means that the bank has a probability that it may collect 170 rupees from such a customer and there is a probability that it may not be able to collect 30 rupees from a customer because of a default. Now, as per the Basel 3 guidelines, the capital adequacy ratio has to be maintained at 8 percentage. Now, what this means is, let's say for a particular bank A, the total loan which it has given is rupees 1000. So, if you add up the total loans given by the bank A, then it would add up to rupees 1000. And if you add up the total risk weighted asset of a such a bank, then let's say it is around 200. 
So if you substitute the value of risk weighted asset into our formula of capital adequacy ratio, it would be tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital divided by rupees 200 into 100 equal to 8 percentage. Accordingly, if you calculate the value of tier 1 capital plus tier 2 capital, it should be in this particular case rupees 16. Now what this essentially means that in order to cover a risk of rupees 200 which may arise in case of bad loans, a bank is required to keep aside rupees 16 of its own capital at all the times. Similarly, if the total risk weighted assets of the bank is rupees 300, then accordingly this particular tier 1 plus tier 2 capital has to increase to rupees 24 or if the total risk weighted assets is equal to rupees 100 then it will be required to keep aside rupees 8 of its own capital in order to cover the risk. So as per the Basel 3 guidelines, the capital adequacy ratio has to be maintained at 8%. Apart from that, an additional capital of 2.5% has to be maintained and this additional 2.5% is known as the capital conservation buffer. As the name suggests, capital conservation buffer, this essentially means that such a buffer has to be built by the banks when the bank's financial position is in a good condition. So during the periods of good financial condition, the bank has to build additional buffer in order to cover the risk from the bad loans. However, in case of India, the RBI has stipulated the stringent guidelines with respect to the capital adequacy ratio, wherein the banks are required to maintain a capital adequacy ratio of 9% as against the capital adequacy ratio of 8% stipulated under the Basel 3 guidelines. So under the Basel 3 guidelines, the total capital that has to be set aside by the banks is 8% plus 2.5 that is 10.5 whereas in case of India, it is 9 plus 2.5 that is 11.5 percentage. Apart from that, we have a concept of leverage ratio that is being tracked under the prompt corrective action. Now the leverage ratio is little different as compared to the capital adequacy ratio. The leverage ratio is calculated as the tier 1 capital of the bank divided by the total assets of the banks. So the difference between the capital adequacy ratio and leverage ratio is in case of capital adequacy ratio the denominator happens to be the risk weighted asset whereas for calculating the leverage ratio the bank is required to take into account the total loans of a bank. So in the example which we have seen here for calculating the capital adequacy ratio the bank would be required to take rupees 200 in its denominator but for calculating the leverage ratio, the bank would be required to take into account this 1000 rupees that is the total loan amount. So these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article. On page number 11, we have an article that is titled as 1 in 3 payments for the maternity benefit scheme credited to wrong account. Recently, the Niti Aayog has published a progress report on the portion Abhiyan. In this particular report, the Niti Aayog has raised certain concerns with respect to the implementation of the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana. Hence, this particular article becomes important mainly with respect to GS Paper 2 Governance under the subsection Welfare Schemes for the Vulnerable Sections of the Population. Even though India has made rapid strides with respect to economic development, its progress on health indicators has continued to remain poor. India accounts for the largest population of the people who are suffering from the malnutrition. Accordingly, in order to improve the health and nutrition status of the women and children, the government of India has launched the Portion Abhiyan in March 2018. Under this particular Portion Abhiyan, the government of India has set various targets. Some of these targets are to reduce the malnutrition by 2% every year, to reduce anemia by 3% every year, and a mission which is known as the Mission 25. Under this particular mission, the government has sought to reduce the stunting among the children of the age group 0 to 6 from the present 38% to 25%. Now, in case of India, the malnutrition is caused because of number of socio-economic reasons. Some of these reasons could be lack of access to clean drinking water, lack of access to sanitation, poor education levels of the mother and so on. Hence, if we have to reduce the malnutrition and improve the health status, we have to have a convergence among all the government programs. Accordingly, one of the main objective of Portion Abhiyan is to have convergence of multiple programs implemented by the government of India. 
Some of these programs are the Integrated Child Development Scheme, Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana, Swachh Bharat Mission, National Drinking Water Mission and so on. So there is a need to effectively implement these programs in order to ensure the success of the Poshan Abhyan. Accordingly, the Niti Aayog tracks the implementation of these programs, tries to identify as to what are the flaws in the implementation of these programs and this is basically done in order to ensure the effective implementation of the Poshan Abhyan program. Accordingly, recently Niti Aayog has published a report on the progress of the Poshan Abhyan. In this particular report, the Niti Aayog has raised certain concerns with respect to the implementation of the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana program. The main objective of this particular program is to provide the maternity benefit to the pregnant and lactating mothers in the form of cash transfer. And this is basically done in order to compensate the wage loss that could be incurred by the women during the childbirth and child care. Please note that the eligible beneficiaries under this particular program are all the pregnant women and lactating mothers but it does not include those pregnant women and lactating mothers who are working with the central government, state government or the PSUs. Apart from that, as part of this particular program, the government provides for a conditional cash transfer of rupees 5000 for the birth of the first child. So please note that the cash transfer is done only upon the birth of the first child and it does not include the subsequent births. Apart from that, a remaining cash incentive of rupees 1000 is also given to the women under a separate scheme known as the Janani Suraksha Yojana. Now we call this particular program as a conditional cash transfer because the cash is transferred to the women only when certain conditions are fulfilled. Some of these conditions are registration of pregnancy, at least one antenatal checkup, registration of childbirth, vaccinations and so on. And this particular scheme is implemented by the Ministry of Women and Child Development. Now coming to the various issues that have been highlighted by Niti Aayog in its report, first and foremost is the faulty payment system. In order to effectively implement the Pradhan Mantri Matru Vandana Yojana, the Government of India has adopted direct benefits transfer. As part of this DBT program, the Government of India collects both the Aadhaar card number as well as the bank account number from the intended beneficiaries. So the idea behind the adoption of direct benefits transfer is to ensure that the money reaches the intended beneficiaries. However, the Niti Aayog has highlighted that almost around 28% of the direct benefits transfer under this particular scheme gets credited to a bank account other than the bank account that has been provided by the intended beneficiary. So what is happening here is that almost around 28% of the beneficiaries have not been able to get the cash into their bank accounts. So since the direct benefits transfer is getting credited to a wrong bank account, almost around 28% of the beneficiaries under this particular scheme are not able to get the benefit. The second issue raised by Niti Aayog is with respect to poor awareness level among the beneficiaries. The Niti Aayog has highlighted that only around 60% of the beneficiaries are aware of the benefits of this particular scheme and only around 60% of the beneficiaries are aware as to which particular bank account the money has got transferred. However, the remaining 40% of the beneficiaries are not either aware of the benefits or they are not aware as to which particular bank account the money gets credited. Thirdly, under this particular scheme, the government of India transfers the money in three installments However, the Niti Aayog has highlighted that there is undue delay in the payment of money between these three installments mainly on account of red tapeism. The last problem highlighted by Niti Aayog is with respect to cumbersome application form. The Niti Aayog has highlighted that in order to avail the benefits under this particular scheme, a beneficiary is required to fill an application form that contains at least 32 pages and this is considered to be quite cumbersome in order to avail the benefits. So these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article. Next we have an article on page number 15 and the article is titled as Tardy Pace of Farm Schemes Ifs the Finance Minister. This article shall be important mainly with respect to prelims under the subsection Indian Economy. 
Presently, the government of India is implementing two schemes for the benefit of farmers. These schemes are PM Kisan scheme and the Kisan credit card scheme. Under the PM Kisan scheme, totally around 9 crore farmers are enrolled. However, under the Kisan credit card scheme, only around 6.67 crore farmers are enrolled. So going forward, there is a need to enroll more number of farmers under the Kisan credit card scheme. Accordingly, in this year's union budget, the finance minister has announced that all the farmers who are presently enrolled under PM Kisan scheme, all these farmers would be covered under the Kisan credit card scheme. Accordingly, in order to ensure the higher enrollment of farmers under the Kisan credit card scheme, the finance minister had launched a campaign on February 10. However, this particular article highlights that there has been poor progress with respect to the enrollment of farmers under the Kisan credit card scheme. Accordingly, let us try to understand certain basic details about the PM Kisan scheme and the Kisan credit card scheme and why there is a need to expand the Kisan credit card scheme. PM Kisan scheme, as you all must be aware, was introduced in the interim budget 2019-20. It seeks to provide for a cash transfer of Rs. 6,000 in three equal installments of Rs. 2,000. And initially, when the PM Kisan scheme was launched, it covered only the small and marginal farmers with a land ownership of up to 2 hectares. However, subsequently the union cabinet has decided to expand the coverage of the farmers under the PM Kisan scheme and presently the PM Kisan scheme includes all the land holding farmers and not necessarily the small and marginal farmers. With respect to Kisan credit card scheme, this particular scheme was launched in 1998 with an objective to provide for the timely credit to the farmers. Under this particular scheme, the farmers can avail the timely credit in order to meet their short-term credit requirements, to meet their post-harvest expenses, to meet their working capital requirements as well as the investment expenditure. Please note that this particular scheme is not only available only for meeting the agriculture related needs, but the farmers can also avail the loans for the allied activities such as the livestock rearing, fisheries, etc. With respect to eligibility of the farmers under this particular scheme, presently this particular scheme includes all the farmers including the sharecroppers and the tenants. Now this is a very important feature of Kisan credit card scheme. This is so because under the PM Kisan scheme, the sharecroppers and tenants are not covered. And please note that the Kisan credit card scheme is implemented by the commercial banks, regional rural banks, cooperative banks as well as the small finance banks. With respect to need to expand the Kisan credit card scheme, as stated before, presently the number of beneficiaries under the Kisan credit card scheme is much lower as compared to PM Kisan scheme. Accordingly, we need to enroll more number of farmers under the Kisan credit card scheme. Apart from that, we have certain problems with respect to agricultural credit and these problems can be solved by expanding the coverage of the farmers under the Kisan credit card scheme. Now some of these problems are first and foremost the share of institutional credit in the overall agriculture credit is hardly at 60 percentage and the share of non-institutional credit is as high as around 40 percentage. Now this means that almost around 40 percentage of the agriculture loans are availed by the farmers from non-institutional sources such as the money lenders and since the loans are availed by the farmers from the money lenders at a higher rate of interest this in turn leads to a debt trap. Secondly, if you look at the share of the small and marginal farmers, they account for almost around 83% of the total farmers within India. However, these small and marginal farmers are presently availing only up to 60% of the agricultural loans. So there is a less coverage of the small and marginal farmers under the agricultural credit. Thirdly, there are huge regional imbalances with respect to agricultural credit where most of the agricultural credit is concentrated in the southern states and less amount of agriculture credit is being concentrated in the northern states. So there is a need to expand the coverage of the Kisan credit card scheme in order to ensure the balanced coverage of this particular scheme. Now these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article. Next we have an article on page number 9. The article is titled as Geological Survey of India Denies the Reports on Gold Deposits in Uttar Pradesh. Recently it was reported in media that Sonbhadra district in the state of Uttar Pradesh has a gold reserves of almost around 3350 tons. Now this was considered to be quite significant because if you look at the present gold reserves within India, 
it is hardly around 630 tons so according to media reports the sonbadra district in uttar pradesh had almost five times the total gold reserves of india however recently the geological survey of india has stated that these media reports are wrong and the sonbadra district of uttar pradesh may have gold reserves of only around 160 kgs hence with respect to this particular article let us understand certain basic details about the gold mining in india now this particular discussion of ours becomes important mainly with respect to prelims under the subsection indian geography if you look at the total gold reserves within india it is around 470 million tons but considering the fact that only around 1.5 grams of gold can be extracted for every 1 ton of gold ore the total gold reserves within india is around 630 tons the gold within india is mainly found in auriferous rocks and the placer gold now auriferous rocks are those rocks which contain gold and in such rocks the gold is mainly found in the form of lodes as well as veins with respect to placer gold here the gold is mainly found in the alluvial deposits of the river along with the sands and sediments so some of the places in india where we come across a placer gold include the sands of subarnareka river in the state of jharkhand sona nadi in the singbam district of jharkhand the sonpat valley in jharkhand and along the banks of panna puza and chabiar river in kerala and if you look at the states which have the highest gold ore reserves now these states are bihar followed by rajasthan karnataka west bengal andhra pradesh and madhya pradesh now these are the states that have the highest gold ore reserves however if you look at the states that are considered to be major producer of gold it is karnataka followed by andhra pradesh now one of the main issue with respect to gold within india is that there is a huge mismatch between demand and supply if you look at the annual production of gold within india it is hardly around 2 tons however the annual demand of gold within india is as high as around 850 tons so because of this huge mismatch between demand and supply gold has emerged as the second largest import item after the crude oil wherein in the year 2018-19 the total value of gold which is imported into india stood at almost around 33 billion dollars now some of the important gold fields in india include the kolar gold field and hatti gold field in the state of karnataka now with respect to kolar gold field the kolar gold field has already run out of the quality reserves and hence it is on the verge of closure the other gold fields within india include the ramgiri gold field in the state of andhra pradesh and recently one more gold field was in news and this particular gold field is the jonnagiri gold field in the karnool district of andhra pradesh now this particular gold field is important because this gold field is said to become india's first privately mined gold mine now these are some of the important aspects which you should know with respect to this particular article now this particular article appears on page number 1 this article talks about a theater form practice in the state of karnataka known as yakshagana initially this theater form was actually forbidden for women however in recent times more number of women have taken up yakshagana in particular this particular article highlights that a muslim woman has overcome resistance and has become part of the yakshagana group accordingly this particular article becomes important from the perspective of history and culture further this article is also important because in prelims 2014 there was a direct question related to yakshagana so let us understand some basic details about yakshagana as stated before yakshagana is a traditional theater form that is practiced in the state of karnataka more importantly it is practiced mainly in coastal parts of karnataka such as udupi dakshin kannada etc and since it is a theater form it is a combination of dance music and drama and traditionally the yakshagana was performed from dawn to dusk now yakshagana was basically evolved during the bhakti movement and hence it has stories drawn from ramayana and mahabharata as its main theme apart from that as you can see in previous year prelims questions have been asked with respect to the important performing arts of india accordingly we have compiled a table which highlights the various theater forms in india so we have highlighted as to in which particular state the theater form is practiced and some important information related to such a theater form 
So this particular table related to theatre forms of India has been included in the PDF for your reference. So please go through this particular PDF to understand the various theatre forms of India. Further, if you look at the question which was asked in prelims 2014, Question here was, consider the following pairs, Garba, Gujarat, Moniattam, Odisha, Ekshagana, Karnataka. Which of the pairs given above is or are correctly matched? So as you can see here, both Garba and Ekshagana are correctly matched, whereas Moniattam is not correctly matched. Moniattam is a dance form that has evolved in the state of Kerala. Accordingly, the correct answer to this special question shall be C, that is 1 and 3 only. Next on page number 16, that is the FAQ section of the Hindu newspaper, we have two important articles from the perspective of UPSC examination. The first article is related to the trade tensions between India and USA and the second article is related to the recent Bodo Accord. Now these two articles we have already discussed in much greater detail in our previous DNS video. The trade tensions between India and USA was discussed by me in the Daily News Simplified video dated 9th of February 2020. And the various dimensions related to Bodo Accord was discussed by Vibosa in our Daily News Simplified video dated 28th of Jan 2020. So I would suggest you to go through these two DNS in order to get an understanding about the trade tensions between India and USA as well as the Bodo Accord. The reference to these two YouTube videos has been given in the description box below. Now based upon our discussion, let us now take up certain prelims questions for your practice. Now the first question here is, which among the following indicators are being tracked by the RBI under the PCA framework? The options given here are capital adequacy ratio, gross non-performing assets, leverage ratio and return on assets. As we have discussed before under the PCA framework of the RBI, the RBI tracks mainly four indicators. These four indicators are capital adequacy ratio, leverage ratio, return on assets and the net non-performing assets. So please note that the RBI does not track the gross non-performing assets, rather it tracks the net non-performing assets. Accordingly, the answer to this particular question shall be B, that is 1, 3 and 4. Now coming to second question, the question here is, consider the following statements related to Kisan credit card scheme. The first statement here is, under this scheme, the farmers can avail loans only for meeting their short term credit requirements. As we have discussed, this statement here is wrong. This is so because under the Kisan credit card scheme, the farmers can avail loans both for meeting their short term credit requirements as well as their long term investment requirements. The second statement reads as the scheme covers only the land owning farmers and excludes the tenant and share coppers. Even this particular statement here is wrong because the Kisan credit card scheme includes all the farmers including the tenants and the share coppers. Accordingly, the answer to this particular question is D, that is neither one nor two. Next, we have an article on page number nine of the Hindu newspaper. The article is titled as the threats to Sundarbans due to climate change. Now, this particular article highlights that Sundarbans, which is home to the endangered flora and fauna, is facing threat due to the climate change. Now, we have not covered this particular article in today's DNS because we have already covered certain basic details about the Sundarbans in our earlier DNS video. The article related to Sundarbans was covered in our DNS dated 14th of November 2019. Apart from that, please note that Sundarbans was in news in March 2019 because it was declared as wetland of national importance under the Ramsar Convention. Now based upon this particular article, a question for your practice here could be consider the following statement with respect to Sundarbans. The first statement here is it is the largest Ramsar site in India, which is correct. The second statement is, it has the largest mangrove forest area within India. Now the Sundarbans account for almost around 60% of the mangrove forest cover and accordingly, the second statement here is also correct. So the correct answer to this particular question is C, that is both 1 and 2. On page number 8 of the Hindu newspaper, we have an article that is titled as Adequate Water in the Kaval Tiger Reserve. Now this particular article highlights that the increase in the water availability in the Kaval Tiger Reserve has led to the decrease in the man-animal conflict. Please note that the Kaval Tiger Reserve is located in the state of Telangana. So accordingly, a prelims question for your practice here is, consider the following pairs of tiger reserves and their respective states. The options given here are Mukundara Hills Tiger Reserve, Karnataka, Kaval Tiger Reserve, Telangana, Satkosia Tiger Reserve, Odisha. 
Please note that the Mukundara Hills Tiger Reserve is located in the state of Rajasthan and not in the state of Karnataka. Whereas the other two options which are given here are correct. Accordingly, the correct answer to this particular question shall be C. That is 2 and 3 only. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. Now let us have a look at the question for the day.